Hello, my name is John Brink and we are on the Brink podcasting from the capital of Northern BC, Prince George. And it's a beautiful day in Prince George, early May, uh, spring a little bit slow in coming, but it's around the corner, I'm sure. And today we have a, an, an excellent and a special guest. guest. His name is Rob Schutz. I've known him for many, many years. He is a RPF, a registered professional forester, and we will be talking about him, his background, his company, and the view on a forest industry and transition. So, Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Appreciate you inviting me. This is, I think, second time we've talked. So, yes, nice to uh, nice location, actually, too. Yes, that was about two and a half years yeah, ago, yeah. and then we did a, a, a program, uh, you know, that we did on Shaw. We did about 35 uh, uh, segments uh, with different people, including you, and that was uh, called an, a Forest Industry in Transition. Yep. And, uh, yeah, or no, a history of the BC forest industry uh, was that called. This is more talking about uh, an industry in transition at, uh, as we uh, go through these in the future. And uh, the one that we did then is still on Shaw. It's still on, I believe, YouTube and is still on, on, uh, on a, a lot of media. And, and the whole idea was to kind of inform people about uh, what the industry is all about, where, what it was, what it is, where it is going. So, uh, so again, thanks for being here. And, uh, you know, the, uh, you are an RPF, which means a registered professional forester. Yep. And, and you got your training. Uh, training was uh, initially University of Toronto, but I came out to Prince George in 1988. Um, and uh, at that time, there wasn't many jobs in forestry in Eastern Canada. So it was know, a right, bad time. That it was. Period, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it was there in, yeah. in British Columbia. It was kind of rebounding and uh, uh, talked to a few different companies at the time and, and Industrial Forestry Service Limited at the time offered me full time, which, you know, I, uh, coming from Ontario, that was unheard of. And right. So from 88 till now, uh, I've been, uh, you know, you transition up and people leave and people retire. And I've been the president of IFS since uh, 19 or since 2010. So just now about IFS years. means Industrial Forestry Service Limited. Yeah, and that has been around. I've been in Prince George for nearly 60 yeah. years, and it was here when I came. Yeah, in 1952, it uh, uh, it was wow. Um, 70 by, years. Yeah, by Larry De Grace back then. 70 years, yeah. right? At least 70 years, right? And and so, what do they do? Um, in the old days, and you know, back in the 1950s, and we were kind of re rehashing some of the stuff, but there was like uh, eight, nine hundred sawmills in this area, and we were just at that time providing forestry consulting advice to all those different small small sawmills transitioning, for, you know, uh, post World War II to how do you get access to fiber, and uh, and facilitating different uh, work with them, mainly with respect to government and how to deal with government bureaucracy and that kind of thing. Um, since, since the early 1980s, we also transitioned to owning one of the larger uh, forest seedling nurseries in British Columbia. And we produce about uh, 20, 22 million seedlings per year for reforestation. Still, still today? Still today, yeah. And you plant them as well? No, no, we just grow them. So yeah. it's all uh, grown under contract for the forest companies or for the Ministry of Forest or BC Timber Sales. And, yeah. uh, and it's all done prior, you know, the contracts are, are awarded. And uh, so nothing is done speculatively. We have the contract, it's a growing contract and we just provide the growing service. They provide seed and we provide the resultant seedlings usually within six months to a year after, after we start growing them. Yeah, so, and just for the benefit of our guests, and, and they are watching internationally from all over, is that uh, we have a, a, the, the largest area of forest in Canada is probably in the interior yeah. of British Columbia by far, right? Yeah. Probably up to about 50% of the total forest and lumber produced is produced in the interior, yeah. relatively yeah. speaking, in the interior of British Columbia. 
and the rest is the rest of Canada. Yeah, but, yeah. So it's the largest area. And then the other area that's always interesting for, uh, you know, for people to understand is that uh, uh, we, we had in the f late 40s, 50s, up to 800 sawmills around the Prince George region. And, and if you look now, we have probably less than a half a dozen, yeah, if yeah. that. Probably we don't even have that, maybe four or five. Yeah. You know. But they're a lot larger. Yeah, yeah, but but and that's the whole point, right? right? So the so what happened then is that the people got an allocation of timber, and then they brought the sawmill to the timber. That's basically, yeah, basically what they yeah, did. Yeah. And then they cut l lumber, rough lumber, usually, and they hauled it to town, to river. Yeah. Planer Road, they called it yeah. then, yeah. To the, and sold it to the planer mills, who would then dress it into finished lumber, put it in boxcars, and sold yeah. it mainly to the United States. Yeah. I know talking to the, some of the older timers, uh, back in those days, uh, they'd wake up in the morning and everybody, everybody had to had put the windshield wipers on because you had uh, sawdust on your, on your cars, and, you know, yeah. that, that quantity. And then, you know, in the 1960s, you transitioned to, well, how do we save or utilize that sawdust and, and, and even the wood chips? And so that was the advent of the, the pulp and paper industry in the interior. Yeah, that was the period that legislation was passed for close utilization. Yeah. It mandated people that got an allocation to timber, they must produce chips, yeah. Yeah. right? And that brought in the larger uh, pulp mills, right? Yeah, yeah. In the mid 60s. And, and and just want to talk a little bit more about yourself though, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, you got your forestry degree in Toronto and then, or in Ontario, then you came here, you started working for IFS, which is the most dominant, not dominated in an adverse way, but the largest forest consulting company in Northern British Columbia, I believe. Yeah. It was then already, and, and, uh, uh, at a, and, at a, and the time that you came here, or even before that, in the mid, 60s we went through a transition in the industry from the smaller mills sitting in the bush which constantly became a little larger a little larger and then to the planer mills that were on planer road where another thing that happened is that why were they on planer road well that's where the railroad was still is yeah. from the cn Canadian National, and then they built a railroad in what they called the BCR industrial site that came in the late 50s, early 60s, and it was called PGE. P yeah, um, yeah, this, a lot of that is before my time, John. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so anyway, the, the reason that he called it PGE, I've forgotten what the acronym stands for, yeah. but, but we called it is PG at last. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it took so long to get it here. Yeah. And, uh, and what that did is all of a sudden now a sawmill that could not just cut lumber, but and then waste the rest of the tree, probably up to 50%, yeah. it was mandated to create chips. Yeah. That meant that the smaller operators that usually were small, employ 10, 12 people or whatever they employed. And, uh, you know, they had to chip the lumber. That meant they had to have debarkers, yep. couldn't have a bark, and then chippers and, and, and make major, major changes. That simply was not possible yep. on a little mill in the bush. And so, so it, it created consolidation. Yeah, yeah. And that consolidation kind of transitioned continuously until probably about 2005, 2010. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, for various reasons, whether it was changes of policy or just uh, the fact that the companies recognized that, you know, uh, bigger is better and, and there's economies of scale and they were, you know, and they were on a mission through the 90s and, and into the early 2000s to, uh, to take capital and reinvest it in the province. 
Um, you know, contrary to what they're saying now is where the, the large mills are taking their money and shipping it out, outside of BC. Well, that's right. kind of a function of, well, there's very little opportunity for large large uh, primary breakdown facilities to reinvest in the interior. Right. They have to, you know, the opportunity is for guys like yourself where it's, uh, it's remanufacturing. Right. Or into uh, something slightly different from remanufacturing where it was bioenergy over the last 10 right. or 12 years. Right. So now just coming back to Rob Schutz. So he was working for uh, IFS, Interior Forest Service, and you work your way up the ranks. And then uh, as you, in, uh, you know, when you came in the late 80s, and then from then on today, you are the president CEO of uh, IFS, and yeah. IFS looks different from what it did then because you had to change with the forest industry. Yeah, um, yeah. Back in the when we started, there was a lot of divisions. Like you know, we had photogrammetry, which was at that time producing a lot of the contour mapping for the for BC. Right. Uh, at that time, I think, or in the eighties, we had probably close to 25, 30 people just in 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 mapping. In the early nineties, we got into GIS and uh, and what you know, is GIS? Uh, geographic information systems. Okay. Uh, what, one of the kind of the first companies in in uh, northern BC to get into that. Yeah. Um, at that time, we had probably fifteen people in GIS, whereas now that that quantity of work is handled by two or three, just because of efficiencies with the programs and that right. kind of thing. So, so we, you have been constantly reinventing yourself. And changing, yeah. And changing because, as the industry does, yeah. because you do other things as yeah. well. Now, the other thing that I quickly, for the benefit of our people that are watching, a lot of times uh, people that the forest industry is not well known by the public in general. Hence, you know, it is so important for yeah. me to have people like yourself on my program so that we can kind of discuss it and kind of make people in a general sense, with all due respect, more knowledgeable yeah, yeah. about the industry, what happens on the ground. And, uh, you know, usually what happens now, at one point there was concerns about it, we are not replanting the trees that we harvest. Yeah. And usually what we say now, that maybe was the case at one time, but in about the mid 60s, when the mandate changed in terms of yeah. who replants, everything changed and they caught up more or less. And today, the way it is, for every tree that is harvested, three other ones are planted. planted yeah, yeah we, we, like, like I said earlier, we got into the nursery business in around 1980, you know, and that was a transition for where government was divesting itself of forest uh, reforestation or, or, or growing seedlings and, and providing opportunity for companies. And so a number of uh, companies got into it. Like even JD Little uh, Nursery started at about the same time. Yeah, that is the uh, uh, nursery uh, plant right Camp attached Ford. to yeah. the pulp mill, yeah. right? Or de yeah. then Northwood Pulp and Timber. Yeah. And, and our nursery grew fairly quickly through the 80s and 90s simply Which because is in of... Uh, Red Rock? Uh, no, ours is uh, down Chief Lake Road. It's Chief about Road. Uh, 18 kilometers northwest of Prince George. Okay. Um, and now we have, you know, initially it started off with eight greenhouses. Now we have 111. And, uh, wow. Uh, we, you know, we have cold storage facilities that, you know, once the seedlings are, are grown, they're put into boxes and stored over winter, but you have to store them at between minus three and minus five degrees Celsius. Um, and so we've, we've got facilities for about 90,000 boxes of seedlings, you know, for our own plus other wow. companies and governments and that. And, and all of that is then uh, shipped to the planting sites, typically starts in end of April, early May, and, uh, and the planting goes through till early September. So when I listen to you and as you go through uh, interior uh, forest service, it means a company that has been constantly trying to keep up or be ahead of changes that will happen. A lot of risk involved. Who, who owns the company? Uh, primarily the employees own the company. Okay. We've got right now about uh, 34 shareholders, um, maybe about five or six of us are our majority where uh, we control the mo you know the majority but every few years actually about every decade we got to go through a transition period and uh, and it's 
mainly through the you know section 85 of the income tax act which allows a transition to uh, to sell shares from you know the the primary holders to uh, y- younger people who want to invest and and that is you know attributable to you know some of the the reason for our longevity is attributable to the fact that we're wanting the younger people to invest in the company exactly and we provide the opportunity and that's the incentive yeah, right yeah very n- interesting to see that uh, you know that under the uh, income act contacts act it allows you to do that and at the same time it draws in uh, other young people yeah. I, I was kind of checking some of the notes and your son Paul is working there too right my brother Paul but my oh, son is it Paul? my uh, my, uh, my son uh, Connor as well oh, my yeah. two daughters also worked at the nursery but uh, they've, they've said now enough you know with uh, enough with the forest industry they're they're into construction and she's doing and, something different yeah, yeah how many children do you have uh, three three yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the two boys one girl yeah yeah no uh, one one boy two girls and right. and it's, they're not mine I have to always clarify with my wife is sitting beside me she says hey it's our kids not uh, yeah yeah, not mine. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's very important so the uh, you know so so this IFS uh, you know that that and I've been in the business here for nearly 60 years I came here in uh, in 1965 and uh, you know, and I was starting right then in particular was the time that the pulp mills were built yeah. and the industry was in major transition from that point forward. And major growth at that time. Major growth. Yeah. And consolidation. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and then, uh, you know, the next thing that I remember is in the early 70s when, the, you know, the structure of the forest industry in the British Columbia is basically that probably 98% of the timber is owned by you and me, the people. Yeah. And that is uniquely different from the states or the southeastern United yeah. States in particular, Sweden and some of the other countries where a lot of times uh, the uh, industry is owned by uh, private or public interest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it then creates a different industry with the underlying concept of the industry here is that already in the 50s, early 60s, company, companies were allocated or had acquired tenure from buying other little companies and accumulating those into yeah. larger ones and that the tenure meant that they had renewable forest license. Yeah. Uh, forever, forever, forever. Not the, quite. Well, they, more or less. They, you yeah. know, there a lot of them, like the forest companies, as long as they um, carry out the obligations on the Forest Act with regard to, you know, payments and reforestation and having the appropriate management plans, then those licenses are renewed. So they have, they had some obligations. So as long as those obligations, and the big one there is reforestation according to the mandates uh, assigned to them under their licenses, um, you know, then, then the opportunity to renew uh, was provided to them. And yeah, it became, uh, you know, and, and some of the companies, eventually acquired more uh, license than they even had the capacity to to operate with or, or had a desire so then they'd be they were able to operate as as log brokers effectively um, in the early 2000s uh, I think it was about 2003 or four you know the government you know the, some of those licenses had appurtenancy uh, clauses within them said that the license was only good as long as uh, you operated a mill However, that wasn't standard across everybody, and so the I think the Liberal government at that time, you know, terminated that pertinency and said, "Well, 2003." Yeah, uh, and and that was to to make it equitable. And I know, you know, depends which area. In some areas, that maybe made sense to terminate that clause for everybody, but at other times, it uh, it really devastated a lot of communities because there was, a, you know, like the underlying principle correct me if I'm wrong and as you know I'm also the vice chair of Kofi I'm the only one that's not tenured sitting around the uh, the table with my friends who are 
all oh, virtually tenured. So this doesn't always make yeah. me the most popular guy in the room, but I am there in the, uh, you know, is that access to timber is a privilege, really, because it belongs to you and me, the people, and with it goes a social contract, meaning that, uh, you know, including uh, the notion or the concept of appurtenancy, which means that the, the timber harvested must be manufactured in the community or the region. Yeah. Now, that may not be practical and was obviously one of the issues in early 2000 yeah. as to where that concept yeah. was changed somewhat for practical reasons. Yeah, yeah, or for consistency reasons. But like I said, and, and, and there's you know, arguments on both sides of the fence in some communities when they see the logs uh, leaving. You know, Mackenzie is a good example. Uh, you know, a lot of logs leave the Mackenzie timber supply area and head to Prince George. Um, you know, other areas same still thing. are today. They still are today. Fort Nelson was another one for many years. McKenzie, and, and, uh, Fort St. James. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think that, you know that, that whole paradigm is changing again now because so you know we had that change in 2003 and appurtenancy was removed, um, and then you know 2004 five there was a, a clawback with respect to. Uh, the size of some of those tenures uh, that the major licensees had, you know, uh, government wanted to increase the size of BC timber sales, you know, the amount of volume that's auctioned, um, you know, and, and increase that, I think at the time was around 12% to increase it to about 20%. And so that meant reducing the size of a lot of those tenures and providing that volume to BC timber sales. Now they're kind of transitioning once more to that, uh, but it's, uh, the transition is to provide more of that volume to First Nations. So I was very involved in the value added sector because uh, in the mid 90s uh, and, and already much earlier, I started the value added plant in 1975 with three employees yeah. and a concept and an idea to introduce more value added products. And one of the things that I did is introduced into Canada finger jointing where you took shorter pieces yeah. of lumber and you glued it together. There were no standards for it. There was no market for it, for all intents and purposes. It took me amazingly, and it's all in my book. Oh, it's gone now, but I had it here. Uh, you know, oh, it's right behind you. Yep. Oh, it's right behind me, guys. So against all odds, describes yep. it all but one on. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, so that was during that period I started in 1975. And then, Gradually from there on in, uh, there was more and more consolidation, uh, less and less companies around. And then in early 2000, uh, another thing happened in the industry and we had a pine beetle attack that started really already in early 2000, really took off big time and uh, from there on forward and yeah. virtually eliminated probably up to one third of the annual allowable cut. Uh, well, initially the pine beetle increased the annual allowable cut. So from 2000 to about 2012, we were on a kind of a uh, fairly steep trajectory of more volume available to try to salvage the dead wood. Yeah, so yeah, on, the, on that yeah. notion, right? Yeah. So the, the, so, but the, the uh, so when the pine beetle was affected by it, everybody knew from that point forward, they would accelerate the cut to solve as many, save as much That's of the pine beetle, would attack by the pine beetle as they could, but it would eventually mean that the annual allowable cut, which maybe was at 60 million meters yeah. annually, hypothetically speaking, had gone up to as high as 80, would have to come back down to 60, and then go down further because of the amount of yeah. the pine beetle being reduced as part of the calculation yeah, yeah. of the annual allowable cut, where today it is probably closer to between 35 and 40 million yeah, cubic yeah. meters. 
So, so one of the, ba- like, I guess coming back a little bit to my background, that through the 90s and that, a lot of the stuff I did was timber supply analysis, you know, usually on, you know, t- t- for a timber supply area or a tree farm license. Um, in, uh, in the, you know, the late, or around 2006, we got involved fairly heavily with BC Hydro and the bioenergy uh, um, initiative by the the government to salvage a lot of that pine, maybe convert a lot of it to electricity through the. Cons- uh, but at the same time, um, so we did a lot of that kind of work. But uh, around, about three four years ago, there was a, a couple of other foresters uh, who had built, and then we recently purchased. Um, uh, a model that basically described the BC forest industry um, using, and, and for the whole province, using a kind of a supply demand perspective. And, and they used that model to forecast, um, you know, what the annual level cut is uh, provincially and at a regional level, and then combine that uh, annual level cut, which is effectively your log supply. And compare that to the regional demand. So, you know, what we're tracking then is all of the sawmills, what their uh, their capacity is in, in a peak market. If they're operating at that capacity, how much sawdust shavings, um, uh, wood chips, hog fuel is produced by each of those, and then balancing that against supply and demand for those different commodities. Um, and we use that to to really. Uh, primarily for the pulp and paper industry, you know, as as we transitioned away from, um, you know, as the annual level cut started to decline after about 2012, the pulp and paper industry was concerned because in the past or pr- leading up to then, they they utilized primarily residual wood chips produced at sawmills, and uh, and at that capacity, you know, looking back, you know, there was lots of wood chips for them to operate. But now, you know, post 2012, sawmills started closing. You know, there wasn't as much log supply. And Maybe as many as 35 sawmills. 30, yeah, sh- almost exactly 35. Shut down episode. in yeah. the province, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And and that transition is still happening. You know, there's a few Probably more. Another four or five to go. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And and to it, be in balance. And to bring to bring it in balance. And so yeah. that we so we provided that kind of uh, uh, industry intelligence mainly through charts uh, showing or demonstrating yeah. supply and demand at a regional level. Yeah. And if if the demand if their demand exceeded supply of residual wood chips, then what's the op- opportunity? And, and then the opportunity as well, is there enough pulp logs or standing dead trees to fill that gap? And, yeah. and so we provided that information. But, you know, we're now at the point where even that, uh, there isn't, a, you know, there's there's not that many dead pine trees left standing anymore. It, they've either been consumed by fire or they've fallen over. Doesn't logic, doesn't lo- logic dictate to us that since you shut down 35 sawmills, you probably have to shut down some of the pulp, pulp mills because but, there's too much capacity. And, and we have over the last uh, number of years, you know, on the, on the coast, Elk Falls have shut down in yep. the interior, uh, you know, uh, Paper Excellence shut down their pulp mill in Mackenzie. They had another pulp mill in Chetwin. Um, you know, there's uh, been a number of those uh, changes to to balance supply and demand. But that pressure is still growing for the pulp and paper industry in BC. Still not done. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing that we have seen, which is an evolution in a way, we saw in the early 2000s uh, the pace picking up on pellet production. Yeah. Pellet meaning fuel pellets, not pellets on which you put. Yeah. Uh, and, and that then kind of accelerated uh, to where now uh, a lot of the residual sawdust and shavings in particular are directed towards pellet production. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, well, the pellets it actually started in one of the, you know, the, I think, uh, I can't remember the fellow's name. Swan. It, John Swan, yeah, yeah. In, uh, in early 90s. Yeah. But uh, they really took off in uh, around 2000. Yeah. Um, and it was simply consuming, you know, stuff that we were burning in those beehive burners until about 2000 and, and yeah. all that sawdust and shavings, which uh, collectively sawdust and shavings is about uh, 
fifteen percent of every log produced yeah. is, is is the volume equivalent. So those yeah. these pellet facilities consumed so all of that. That increased the utilization of the log really. Yeah. So there we came from the fifties where they squared up the log and all the side lumber was all kind of burned yeah. or wasted and probably fifty percent of the log was wasted. Yeah. And then it gradually went through chipping that obviously shut down many, many mills uh, of the 500 or 800 that were here. And then, uh, then the evolution became further in one, two chips and, and uh, uh, hawk and, and sawdust yeah. and shavings into pellet. Now, to a certain extent, since I was part of all of that too, in 1975, we de developed a system in which we would take the short pieces of wood and started gluing them together in a, a, a product that became finger jointed lumber yeah. that was straighter, not subject to twist. Initially, what everybody said to me, John, don't even try it because that will never work. It's firewood glued together, nobody will buy it. The market now, and it was me substantially, I have to blow my own horny yeah, because yeah. I, I put a lot of my yeah. life into it, it's all in the book, is that we, we developed the market in, uh, uh, you know, the, in, in, uh, mainly in Dallas where there's a lot of heat in, uh, in building and, a lot, and, yeah. and, and, and some of the products that are close to being utilized down there is uh, a southern yellow pine which tends to be hard twist yeah, yeah. and crook a lot and they needed straight lumber products. Yeah. So now a lot of times the products that we produce in the finger joint plant, where most of the wood that we are using was gone into the burner mm -hmm. before, yeah. not far thereafter into the chipper. Now we are gluing it together into a product that we just cannot make enough of it for yeah. the market. And it gets, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, up to 20 to 30% more in value than a solid stud does. Yeah, yeah. And we cut not a single tree and we employ 400 people. Yeah. So you and I have talked about that a few times in the recent past and, and, you, and you know, the speculation is, is how can you grow that market? And uh, you know, a lot of things have changed. Even with Ukraine, there's been a, a number of changes. The big yeah. one potentially is, is that uh, you know, there's less Russian wood coming into Europe that Russian wood is going to go feed uh, considerably more of the Chinese demand. So that Chinese demand will probably decrease in the BC interior. So, and, and traditionally in the interior, you know, the Chinese demand for our, our lumber has been the lower quality or lower grades, the economy scale. So if the, that volume or if that demand in China isn't available or, or doesn't exist because of the influx of wood from, from Russia, the opportunity then is, well, can you remanufacture some of that economy grade, which w might be a surplus in the near term yeah. and, uh, and produce something of higher quality. So that's, that's the one. But then what, we, you, what you and I have always discussed is what's the incentive for the forest companies to to sell that economy grade wood to you to remanufacture it and produce a higher value. And, and that, that incentive doesn't really exist right now. Even if no. you're willing to pay market value, they, uh, a lot of those companies, it's, it's, it's uh, you, you know, you're kind of a... It's a, easier to, to do it that yeah. way. A lot of times it's driven by the market people, yeah. and I say that respectfully, and it really doesn't get the intention or in attention of the senior levels. Yeah. And they say, well, just sell it. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and even if they're losing money, it's just uh, you know they're making significant profits now off of their their premium grades. So it's exactly it's, yeah. And my battle has been ever since I got here, and because of my background, likely is that uh, I'm a great believer in in, in uh, value added. And then we are so fortunate because the best timber in the world that is grown anywhere virtually is grown in the interior yeah. of British Columbia. And the products that we make out of it a lot of times is dimension lumber. I call it respectfully to a certain yeah. extent, spaghetti. And, uh, and the companies have done very, very well at it and uh, uh, over the period, but the industry is still very much in transition. Yeah. And that's where 
you know, like even in the mid 90s when I was the founding president of the BC Council Value Added Boot Processes in the province of British Columbia. We, t we brought together, I was the founding president, it's an amazing feat actually, six, uh, eight associations up to 800 members throughout the province. Yeah. That was the first time that we were sitting on the front seat with government and saying that there is future in the value added sector. How do we incent the majors that control the timber to supply wood to secondary manufacturers? It was all very deep then, there was no particular incentive. You can use a carrot or a stick. It should be on the basis of business to business, yeah. not subsidy and handouts and subsidy. That doesn't work. And so we then decided that the, the currency is fiber or timber. And so they created the small business program. Uh, the small business program was a clawback of the yeah. tenure system, put about 10 million meters, about 15% or so, into that particular program. I think it was in that yeah, area. Yeah. And, and that was dedicated to secondary manufacturers. Yeah. Unfortunately, there were flaws in the program that the, uh, the programs like that have a tendency of being abused if they are not properly regulated. Yeah, yeah. The, the wood was left in the program. Uh, it's now called BCTS, yeah. BC Timber Sales. The 10 million meters is still there. The program has since disappeared. And with it, a lot of the companies that were relying on it or, sub, or they're using and, that system And that was subsidize. all part of the 2003 yeah. BC Liberal government and yeah. it was uh, under uh, Premier Gordon Campbell that eliminated, uh, you know, a the concept of appurtenancy. Yeah. And yeah. they eliminated the small business program to stimulate secondary manufacturing and a number of other things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not a good time for the forest industry. As a result of that, and add to that, uh, the, the, the industry together with government not protecting the secondary sector from paying duties on exporting of lumber. So, uh, uh, you know, like uh, people like ourselves were forced to pay up to 20% of the revenue, sales yeah. revenue to duties. And that meant, and, and the reason that there were duties is because the allegations, right or wrong, that the, sale, that the marketing of timber was subsidized so therefore, there should be a penalty. Well, company, most secondary manufacturers didn't have timber. Yeah, yeah. They were buying lumber. At market value. At yeah. market value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and even then were penalized. And a lot of times that happened because governments totally forgot about including secondary manufacturers. Yeah. In but, you, but yours was one of the fewer ones that uh, were, was 100% market. There, you know, some of the other companies, they're, they're secondary manufacturing, but they also have primary, and so yeah. it, it yeah. becomes it a was, loss. Uh, you know, but, but what it showed, even still today, that there is huge potential yeah. in further manufacturing. I still believe, and I and uh, you know. So, what has happened now to the uh, to the forest industry uh, again with uh, the current government uh, under uh, 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 Premier Organ uh, uh, said uh, after the pine beetle and and then the spruce beetle and some of the terrible fires that we have had the reduction of the AEC has come down substantially to maybe between 35 yeah. and 40 million meters annually. 35 companies have already disappeared, probably another four or five primary mills. Yeah. Where are we going to go with, the, with this industry is the question. And what I've said is that I believe the future is innovative primary in combination with intensive yeah. secondary. Yeah. So and, and that's really you know from the gover you know from the government perspective they recognize that there's a few more mills have to shut down just to balance supply with demand. Correct. 
uh, you know, where's the opportunity for them to help or, or grow the business? Um, and it's in, you know, secondary manufacturing. So that's what they're probably looking at is, okay, how do we strengthen the secondary manufacturing oh, sector? Oh, the value added. Yeah. Or the value added sector yeah. um, in, in recognition of all of these closures. Is Correct. there opportunities for these small towns um, to, to better utilize? Because all we're doing really right now is, like you said, spaghetti mills, they're shipping. Uh, you know, very effectively and very productively, a lot of uh, lumber to the U.S. primarily. Um, and if we can utilize some of that lumber locally, um, you know, in, in secondary manufacturing. Make new products for new yeah, markets. Yeah. Then, uh, you know, then it's a win-win for the smaller communities. The other part, Rob, that is troubling to me is that uh, what has happened over the last number of years, the last 20 years, further consolidation, 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 where now in the interior of the province, we probably have four companies that control 80% of the AEC. That to me, me well, maybe, maybe it's, it's 75%. Maybe 60, 70, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But a, a size, of, uh, maybe the top six have yeah. Yeah. 80%. But I'm saying if you have that much capacity, you control it all. Yeah, because then what happens next then, and and uh, and and then the other part about it is that industry has taken a very strong position in terms of saying, well, uh, the stumpage prices are high, the bureaucracy is too much. Maybe a rightful see so, uh, but they have decided by and large to say we're no longer going to invest in BC. We're going to yeah. invest elsewhere mainly in the U.S. Southeast, uh, you know, where there is uh, uh, timber available, there's yeah. southern yellow pine, or in Sweden or Germany or wherever else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, and questions are asked by the public, if it is our timber, then if they don't want it, then maybe somebody else does. Well, it's not that they don't want it. I think they're using everything that there's available to them. The, you know, the issue then becomes it's, it's, they're, they're making a lot of money the last few years, but they've also lost a lot of money in other years. So when they make, you know, when capital is, is, is flush, where do you invest it? You can't invest it in British Columbia other than in secondary manufacturing, and that's a you know, relatively smaller part of the pie. Where do you put it? And so the opportunities is really, uh, you know, is is southeastern U.S. You know, the, for the next eight nine years anyway, the uh, demand will exceed what their supply is down there. So, the or sorry, opposite. Their their, their supply yeah. of wood down there far exceeds what the demand is. Yeah. At this time. Yeah, and and it will keep expanding yeah. there. Highly likely, right? So the uh, so what has happened then in the meantime is that the government and uh, I think the last uh, we just had a conference, uh, uh, the Kofi, the Council of Forest Industry, at their annual meeting here last week in Vancouver. The one before about eight hundred people yeah. in attendance. It is the umbrella organization representing most of the forest industry yeah. in British Columbia, if not pretty much all. And the last one we had was in 2019. Uh, you know, that was the last yeah. live one. And uh, the government then, relatively new, made uh, a, a statement to the industry uh, in saying they want to see further investment in the industry, in particular as it relates to value added. Yeah. They wanted also to have more participation by First Nations and they wanted and the, the primary industry, those that are in control of the, of, of the uh, annual allowable cut, yeah. to work closely with First Nations and value-added yeah. operations. And so that's where some of the risk exists with the, the forest companies. So we're, like you said, an industry in transition. And rightly so, more of the volume is being allocated to First Nations. The big question is, is what are the First Nations going to do with that volume? And I think the government struggled with that too. They don't. They don't want to see that. Okay, uh, your First Nations X Y Z company, and you know you're allocated, you know, a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand cubic meters per year in your area, or whether it's a First Nations woodland license or or some kind of a long-term tenure. 
Um, and as soon as you got that, are you going to continue to operate as per the existing forest uh, you know, policy and regulations and that? Or are you just going to say, no, uh, we don't like the industry, we've got the volume, we're going to shut it down. And all of a sudden, you've got all of these mills that were relying on that volume. And so there's the risk right now. You know, they don't know. And I th and you've got about 206 different First Nations bands across, you know, all with their own personal biases and, and uh, individual objectives. Um, what are they going to do? You know, and some of them, I think, will be business as usual. Like, you know, they've got good relationships. A lot of the companies over the last 10 years have, have spent a lot of effort building the relationships with First Nations so that uh, they can carry on work. But in other areas, um, you know, the capacity doesn't exist with the different bands um, to, to even manage that. So are they going to, you know, the risk to the companies is, are, they, are those First Nations who are awarded that volume, are they, is that volume going to be available to continue processing? So then that then being said, it was something that was mandatory by Demalgamote for one yeah. that determined, and I'm uh, not a lawyer obviously, and, uh, but just recalling from it, that said that, uh, you know, that First Nations have to give consent or, or have to be consulted and that turned it into consent as yeah. one. And then other legislation, both uh, federally and provincially, in combination with the United Nations, said that uh, uh, the Aboriginal or the uh, uh, should be uh, are owned or have right to a portion yeah, of the yeah, timber. Yeah. Hence, that has happened. Uh, one of the things that has happened, I think, is latest last week, where there is a sharing of revenue yeah. between the Crown and First Nations. Yeah. I think to the amount of about seventy million or something like that yeah. annually, and that likely will grow. That then being said, is saying what will then happen to that volume? Yeah. Well, for all intents and purposes, we already know and I say that respectfully, at least not in the medium, short to medium term, that they are not going to go out and build sawmills. Highly unlikely. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there is room for creating partnerships or relationships. Yeah, yeah. The likelihood is that that will happen with existing, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, quota holders or uh, holders of already AAC, that need more volume. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then the other part means that, uh, you know, so that then deals with the, what the government rolled out, I believe it, it was in 2020, June of 2021, is saying that we want to modernize the industry and they rolled out what they called the intentions paper. That meant more interaction between First Nations and the primary sector, those that have timber and that, those that don't. Yeah. And the other part is more interaction with the primary sector, those that have timber or other ones, sources of timber in the value added sector. Yeah. So they have done things on the value added sector, not much else on the, va on the value added side. And the challenge there is that if you want to be a value-added uh, operation, then it takes major investment, like uh, uh, you're familiar with our operation, and it's probably well in excess of $150 million yeah. involved in investments here in Prince George, Vanderhoof, uh, uh, Houston, and other things that we are involved in. We want to double in size here, but we have no access to fiber. Yeah. So what we are saying is that is that the volume allocated to the value added sector in BCTS, the 10 million meters, should be designated to the value added se sector or set aside for the value added se sector so that they can then have bring something to the table if they negotiate with primaries about having access to fiber. Right now, what would happen if you are a value-added uh, operator, you go to your lenders, 
your banks or whatever they are, and you're trying to invest, say, 20, 30, 40 million, which is nothing really for building a plant that yeah. doesn't even get you close. But they, they would say, where's your fiber? Yeah. Well, I haven't got any. Well, have a nice day because yeah. that, that's not going to work. Yeah. So we will not get value added unless we recognize the, the fact that, that they must have access to fiber. If already less than a half a dozen control close to 80% of all the uh, uh, DAC in, in, the, in, the, in the province or in the interior and, and in the province, then there is no more timber available unless we look at BCTS, that volume was set aside for that purpose. Yeah. And so what would happen to that volume if, if it uh, came, became part of the value added, stimulating the value added sector? is then in most cases it would be available to the primaries and then yeah because the well your your sector doesn't really want the the logs no. you just want the the logs become a currency yeah uh, that's to, what it would yeah, be and, and to trade yeah you know, lower grade lumber, on a business yeah, to business yeah, relationship yeah. right and and so that is the only way that i can see that we have a reasonable chance of creating a value-added sector. Although we have done it without that, yeah, yeah. but we probably one of the few, if not the only it's one. Just, it's, it's the wording in, in the legislation or the regulations on how do you provide that access to fiber such Correct. that it doesn't create, uh, you know, what, what happened in the late 90s and that with the yeah. value-added sector where they're using it as leverage to uh, to make an artificial industry. And yeah, it, well, it was not properly written yeah. in, uh, because uh, it, it became more or less of selling the timber and not doing anything yeah, yeah. for it, you know. So it would have to be based on, on, on hard uh, existing companies or ones that have committed already their volume, yeah, yeah. right? That they are uh, prepared to put up a company. Yeah. But that in my opinion, is the only way. And uh, so we'll have to see what happens there. But uh, then kind of, so as we look forward then, Rob, is that it clearly, clearly is still an industry in transition, which still has huge challenges. You know, we have uh, most of the annual allowable cut is controlled by a few. And, and most of the few don't feel it is viable for them to invest here for whatever reason they have, uh, you know, and, and so how then, how then do we change the industry? The other part about it is that, uh, you know, is uh, to consider uh, here is that it's an industry in transition that has to make new products for new markets that includes part of it uh, being dimension lumber, but probably up to 50% could be created in new products in falling under the category of mass timber. CLT uh, and, and a variety of other building materials, it is the most, v most effective value in building is wood, uh, you know, and, and it's used more and more. It is a the carbon footprint is growing more fiber, more timber, yeah. using more fiber and timber in building. Where does it go from here? Well, like you said, we're in transition. Um, that part of that transition is still uh, a decline in the annual allowable cut. And we've seen, you know, like you said, and, and uh, we agree that it's probably about three or four more mills would shut down. That's prior to that intentions paper and, and the, all these other initiatives that the government's now impo slowly imposing, you know, everything from uh, the old growth initiative, you know, with the deferrals, that's, that could potentially uh, result. Maybe not in, in sawmill closures, but in the, at least in the reduction in the size of a lot of the sawmills, they're gonna, yeah. you're going to see a lot of mills take some of the capital that they've made over the last few years and, and retool, uh, make them more efficient, uh, probably at a smaller scale. And, and, and I, we know of some of the mills that are looking at that very closely. You know, what's, what's the, 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 
given the size of the various mills, how do you redesign them or retool them for a smaller log, uh, log supply, a slightly different log profile, whether it's smaller trees or larger trees. And, you know, it, it, we've, we're moving away from salvaging dead pine to, uh, you know, steeper slopes, uh, larger spruce, a lot more balsam, you know, balsam fir now is probably used to be 5% of the harvest. Now it's closer to 20, 25% of the harvest. So all of those things are transitioning, but you're also seeing fewer, fewer mills um, and, and a smaller scale. So where's the opportunity while it's like, you know, yourself or companies similar to you, where can we produce, instead of shipping a lot of this economy grade lumber to, to China, where that volume or that demand will probably dry up, can we? Does it make you wonder though, that if I don't cut a single tree and I employ 400 people, I've really not yeah. shut down at any time that it makes you wonder that if I can do it with a product like that, wouldn't we be able to do much more than that? And then the other part about it is that, you know, that if, if the mills would start investing, which I hope they do and are, they are looking at that, obviously, yeah. even if they did, the mills would become smaller for a given, they would employ much less people. Yeah. That most mills, even when I was in the mills and piling lumber, they'd be 150. Now it's probably down to 50, if that, and they would be down to half or less than yeah, that yeah. as they go forward. So the industry, the primary industry will employ less. Isn't it a given that the, the natural and the obvious is further manufacturing of value added? In some areas, you know, you, you've, you've got more insight than probably most of us with respect to how much, you know, how much can you grow further in Prince George? Um, you know, there's a certain limit on, you know, the, what the value of the, you know, the finger joint plants uh, volume that you're producing and, and how much can you purchase of, I, of the... I say that's only a, mean, yeah. a small part of it. I say up to 50% of the primary production can be directed to further manufacturing. No question about that. And that would immensely increase the uh, employment in the industry. Yeah. There is no question in my mind about that. And the proof of that is all around the world yeah. in all the different places. So, and I see what you're saying, but it comes down to then if that opportunity exists, then well, how come some of the manu the majors, whether it's the West Fraser, see, you know, the Gorman has done that significantly in, yeah. uh, in the, they have one in, example. Uh, but, you know, uh, Sinclair has done that to some extent. With some their, extent, yeah. uh, so then, you know, you look at the other, you know, West Fraser and Canfor, um, you know, uh, Tolco. You know what the reason is? It's a whole different business. And a lot of these yeah. companies are public companies. With all due respect to my friends that are the CEOs of those companies, they're not going to change that whole business model around yeah. uh, at the risk of they are being judged on a quarterly basis for performance. And if yeah. it is not up to where the shareholders think it should be, they won't be there. Yeah. Yeah. So an entrepreneurship, uh, with all due respect, is, is hard to come by. You know, to find those individuals that will lay awake like myself all night to try to figure yeah, out yeah. a new way and how do you deal with that. That's, that's a very rare commodity to yeah. find. Yeah, there's, and so lacking then uh, the incentive and, you know, the, the currency, currency incentive is fiber. of fiber and, and in recognition of the fact that their objective is short term profit uh, for the shareholders. There's no motivation for them to change no. their business model at this point in time. Though the opportunity is, in my opinion, is in value added. Yeah. And then uh, part of uh, the currency is timber, you know, and to, to allocate uh, uh, part of the timber basket to legitimate value-added operations that interact on a business-to-business -business level with other majors. And I believe yeah. that then comes back to what I've always said, this, the future of the industry is innovative primary in combination mm -hmm. with innovative uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, secondary manufacturing or yeah. value-added manufacturing. 
Yeah, well, it's it's up in the air. A lot of that is government policy now in the near term, and exactly. whether the government will, uh, you know, look forward uh, uh, and, and take the 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 big steps. I guess you could say, and uh, because they, you know, on the one side they are operating a lot of times in lock and key with uh, the majors. Yeah. Um, and, and considerable lobbying and pressure from them. And on the other side, it's individuals like you that are seeing the kind of a vision of something different. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll see what government will, will, uh, will do with respect to changes in forest policy uh, and yeah. legislation. Rob. It was a pleasure to have you right, John. Uh, as a guest again. And uh, for our listeners, uh, you know, the, uh, it's always very interesting to uh, interact with uh, Rob Schutz in particular that has been so much part of this industry, especially during a period where the industry is in transition. And, uh, and he has the benefit of being on the ground level in a lot of cases, is very familiar and is, is trusted by people on all sides uh, uh, government and the majors as well as uh, finding directions because have no illusions about it that uh, you know that even for the major operators they are seeking for directions especially as it is NBC which is so unique in terms of that the timber is owned by the people of British Columbia there is a, a social contract attached to that and to find directions in an ever-changing market is challenging to say the least, but uh, I'm sure that both Rob and myself will be part of the change as it happens and in the future as we go forward, I hope to interview more uh, stakeholders like Rob and others uh, on the primary side uh, into our podcast to keep people informed and to understand what's happening on the ground level. So thank you again, Rob, uh, for Thanks, being my John. guest. Yeah, it's been a pleasure.